Cool. Hey everyone, welcome to my talk, uh, an introduction to Pocketbase, uh, Go-based backend as a service. A little bit about me, I'm a C Majid. I'm a backend software engineer at Curve. Um, there's a link to my website. Um, I'll link the slides and stuff at the end. Uh, so just briefly how I came across Pocketbase. I joined Curve about six months ago. And most of what we write, uh, we write using Go. So I was like, okay, I need to learn Go, improve my Go skills. So I decided to build a full stack app, decided to build a bookmarking tool. Uh, and then I came across Pocketbase and I thought this would be great. I can you know, use this as a backend. Uh, unfortunately, since then, I've basically fallen afoul of this meme where basically I found Pocketbase almost to be too good and I ended up not writing much code and it just has become another unfinished side project. But I thought it's an interesting tool and I'll share it with you guys today, and you can see maybe it might fit your use case, um, and maybe you'll actually you know, finish something with it. Um, I'll also have a link to my, my, my unfinished project as well, um, so you can take a look at that if you, if you want. Anyways, uh, some of you might be wondering, what's a backend as a service? Um, so this is like, I think this is a term that's probably come up, come up in the last like decade or so, and basically what it does is it kind of handles the basic repetitive tasks that uh, you need to do in an app, so things like authentication, uh, things like database management, so you know, lots of apps need to add things to database, create, read, update, delete, you know, those, those sorts of operations. Uh, email verification, password resets, all these things are usually, what they'll do is they'll provide an API, so you don't have to write that code yourself, it's kind of just there, available, and more often than not, some of the more popular tools will have um, SDKs, like JavaScript SDKs, so you can just use uh, JavaScript functions, for example, and it's making API calls behind the scenes, but you don't really notice that. So that's kind of what they do, and they're quite, they can be quite powerful. Uh, some of you may have probably used one or heard of it, or heard of a few. So we've got Firebase here from Google, which is probably the most famous. We've got Superbase, which I think was inspired by Firebase, and it's uh, like an, kind of an open source version, but it's kind of spun off into its own thing. Both of these are managed. Um, I think you can run Superbase locally, but m I think it's easier if you just use the managed version. And then you have Amplify, which I believe is from AWS. And so Pocketbase uh, fits in with these kind of uh, tools, and you can probably tell a little bit by the name. So why use Pocketbase? Well, we're at a London Gophers meetup, and so it probably won't surprise you a lot to know that it basically it's written in Go. So it's, it's open source, written in Go. It has a quite an easy-to-use dashboard, which we'll take a look in just a second. Uh, and part of that, uh, it compiles into a single binary, and so it includes the dashboard, includes the, a SQLite DB, which we'll touch on in a little bit. And according to the author, it can handle about over 10,000 concurrent connections on just a $6 virtual private server. So for lots of hobby projects and side projects and probably medium-scale apps, it's probably actually good enough. And the main killer feature that we're going to talk about, or what really sets it apart from other projects, is we can extend it and use it as a framework. So you, you have your kind of web frameworks in Go, like Jin, uh, Mux, which I think is not being used anymore, uh, but or has been archived, I think. But anyways, as tools like that, uh, web frameworks like that, we can, uh, we can do something similar with Pocketbase. So very quickly, we'll just take a quick look at the dashboard. Hopefully you can see that. So once you spin up the binary, uh, you'll get a dashboard like this. It'll give you like your login with an admin account. It's quite pixelated, but essentially it just provides a really easy way. You kind of have some, your tables on the left there called collections. You have records here, which are your rows in the uh, database. You can come over here. You can edit the rows. You can add new fields. You can add indexes. Basically anything you can kind of do via code, you can do via the dashboard and you can set a bunch of other useful options as well. It's really nice and it does make developing with it quite straightforward, um, and it does help, when, especially when you're developing locally with the tool. Anyways, uh, for the main part of this talk, what I'm gonna show you guys is how we can use a framework, how we can use it as a framework. And so essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, Pocketbase, uh, use it as a framework, add an endpoint, add something to the database, uh, write some tests, and then deploy it. So we're gonna kind of go from zero to hero really quick with Pocketbase. There'll probably be a bunch of stuff, but it's more just a quick, uh, a more quick introduction, I'm not gonna go particularly deep in uh, any of the topics. If you have any questions, please catch me at the end. Right, so we're just gonna scaffold a really simple uh, project. Uh, I've added dots there just because otherwise it got too big and it didn't look nice, but yeah. So we, we, we uh, create a new mod file and then we uh, download the pocket-based dependency. Then uh, we create a main.go file uh, and then we import pocket-base and then essentially we just start, start pocket-base and we start the web, uh, web, web service as you would with probably lots of other web frameworks. Then we can run it like with a bit of code like this. We could obviously compile it and run that binary as well and then pass this, you know, this serve flag. Uh, and then this is now available on localhost 8080. And if we went, 
we would be able to access the dashboard and we would be able to access the APIs. We haven't actually done anything. Uh, this is basically equivalent of having the pocket-based binary downloading and running it yourself. Uh, but obviously, we've got it in, uh, instrumented in some uh, Go code now, and we can actually go and extend that. So let's take a look at how we can do that. So uh, if we add a root, we can do something like this. Behind the scenes, uh, Pocketbase is using an echo server. If you, if you look at the import at top, you can see it's using echo v5. Uh, and so basically anything you can do with the Echo Web Framework, I'm pretty sure you can do in PocketBase, and it does expose a bunch of methods uh, that, uh, that uh, Echo uses to you as well. So anything that I've wanted to do with Echo, I've been able to do via PocketBase in some way. Uh, there's probably a few things you, you cannot do, but I haven't uh, come across them. Anyways, we have this app on before serve, so PocketBase has a bunch of useful hooks that you can hook into. So when various actions happen, we can hook into those. So before the app is served, we're going to use uh, we're going to do e.router, which is uh, the echo router, and we're just going to add a new. Unfortunately, that's cut off a bit, but we're going to add a new post endpoint for uh, for letting users uh, add comments. Let's say we have a blog and we want people to create new comments, uh, and so yeah. Uh, and then we're going to have a handler function and some middlewares. So if we actually write some code, it will probably look a little bit like this. Uh, not the easiest to see, but we've just done a bit of plumbing here. And so what we're doing, just to get kind of the basic structure, we have a handler function. So when this endpoint is called, we're just going to return a 201 back uh, to the client and say, oh, it's been created. Don't worry. And then we have a bunch of middlewares, which uh, PocketBase provides. So we don't have to write them ourselves. Uh, and the two middlewares, one checks that the user is authenticated. So we don't have to write any authentication logic ourselves, and then the other will just make uh, requests, uh, log requests for us, uh, and so we'll get we'll get some information about latency and various other things that you often see in middlewares when uh, when making a request. So uh, they, they have a bunch of other middlewares that you can use, and as I say, any of the Echo ones you can use, and any Echo compatible ones you, you should be able to use as well. Then uh, on the client side, we we can do something like this. So this is some JavaScript code. Uh, and so we just create a pocket-based object. We connect to our pocket-based instance. Uh, I've skipped the code to authenticate with the user because it's not, it's not complicated, but it's just going to clutter what we have. After we've authenticated, we can just do this uh, pocket-based.send uh, function, and that's basically just a wrap around fetch. So anything, if you're familiar with JavaScript fetch, anything you do with fetch, you can kind of do with this. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about this function is that it will handle authentication for us. So it uses uh, JSON web tokens uh, with, with auth, auth, uh, OAuth. And uh, so, uh, so it's, it's sending that token for us. And we don't have to worry about you know, adding the header field and doing all that. So a little bit less boilerplate. So that's how we can call it from, uh, from JavaScript. Now, some of you guys will be thinking, well, we haven't really done anything interesting yet. Uh, most endpoints will interact with the database in some way. So let's take a look at how we can add a comment to, to the database. So first, there's a few ways to do this, and I actually had to rewrite this uh, because I, I preferred this way to the way I'd originally written it. And uh, PocketBase is iterating quite quickly, so there are a lot of changes. I think this, this, was, this was a good change that they did. Uh, so we, we define a comment struct here, which basically represents our comments table. Uh, and it's going to have a, 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 relation, a foreign key relationship with a post table and a user table. And we're just going to store a message, which is just going to be the comment that the user left. Uh, in my case, uh, we now fill this struct out. In my case, I've, I've written a really simple like dummy message, hi, way from, and then we're just going to use their username. Normally, obviously, you'd have this more dynamically set and probably be receiving this in the body of the request. I've also hard coded the post ID, but this is just for simplicity. And uh, also, you probably wouldn't have the handler function in your main.go file. You probably split into multiple files and have a more um, structured uh, architecture. But that's fine. This is just, again, just to keep it really simple here, uh, just so it's a bit easier to follow. But so we've created this struct here, uh, this comment record, and then we can save it in the database. Uh, like so, we can also uh, there's also a mechanism for uh, for us to do transactions because it's a SQL database, and that's one of the big uh, killer features is you can do transactions. So PocketBase also provides a really nice mechanism to do that. Um, I'll have a link at the end if, if, if people are interested. Next, on the DB side of things, often we'll want to run migrations. Uh, so for those of you who might not be aware of migrations, there's a few reasons you might want to write database migration files. So one of them, it codifies what you're doing. So basically, when we're creating new tables and stuff, we now have them in Go code. And so they can be version, they're in version control. Uh, they can be reviewed. Uh, they also will provide ways to roll back changes. So if something goes wrong, you can roll them back. 
often our schemas are very, really static. You know, you'll want to create new tables, you'll want to uh, delete fields, et cetera, et cetera. So it's good, it's good to have that. So um, again, Pocketbase provides a really nice mechanism on app startup to create, uh, to, to load in these migrations. So how we can do that is we import our migrations folder, which I just showed you previously, assuming there's a migration there. Then before our app starts, we pass it this function, which basically you don't have to necessarily worry about the details, but we're passing it the app. And we also pass it this auto migrate uh, parameter, which I find really useful. And it basically means if you make a change in the UI, what that does is it will make, it'll save a migration file locally for you as a, uh, as a go file. And you don't have to write that yourself. So I use that a lot when I was developing. Um, Finally, I wanted to touch on SQLite, but just before, I don't want to start a holy war here, but can you raise your hands if you pronounce it SQL in the crowd? Okay. Uh, and can anyone, uh, can everyone else raise their hands who pronounce it SQL? Oh, okay. I used to be Team SQL, by the way, but uh, <laughs> I've since, uh, since anyways. Um, so some of you would have heard SQLite, isn't that only for dev? Can you use that in production? And, and whilst there potentially are a few issues around especially high availability, um, uh, performance-wise, it's actually usually good enough. So default, when you're using SQLite, it, it uses a journaling mode called rollback journal mode. And Pocketbase is using something called write-ahead logging mode, war mode. I don't have time to go into the specifics, but essentially the journaling mode is just how the data eventually gets written to disk. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's stored in the database. I did have a nice animation, but unfortunately we don't have time. So the main performance gains we get from using war mode is we have fewer f-sync operations, where an f-sync operation is this POSIX operation, which takes memory that's buffered, uh, uh, sorry, data buffered in memory and saves it to disk. So if SQL like crashed, you know, it could, uh, when it starts back up, it has that data and it can either roll back or it can uh, carry on with its operation. Uh, so we have few of those and that is obviously a slow, relatively slow operation. And then it provides more concurrency because when we do write operations, they don't block read operations, which is not true always in rollback journal mode. You can have writers blocking readers. So by those two things there, we, we gain a lot of performance. And for most apps, war mode is the way to go. Uh, next, we are going to look at how we can write some tests. Uh, normally, you know, people might say you should write tests before, but just for the flow of this presentation, I've written, shown you how to write tests after. Pocketbase provides a really nice mechanism for us to write tests. It has this API scenario struct, and basically on top is a bunch of inputs and then outputs. Even things like expected events is what we expect to kind of change in the database, and we're basically testing that. And this is uh, table-based testing, so this is a slice. Uh, and then we can just run this one at a time, like so. Uh, and uh, we can even pass it an existing SQLite database file, and it, uh, we can preload that with some data, and we can run that with some expected state, and that's quite nice. And very quickly, finally, we want to deploy our app. You know, we want to make sure that the whole world can see our amazing, you know, comment uh, or blog app. So how do we do that? Well. I would usually start off with a Docker image because it opens up where you can deploy. You know, there's a GCP cloud, uh, cloud run, app runner from AWS, uh, fly.io, which we're going to look at. So really quickly, I'm not going to go into details of this, but we have a multi-stage Docker image. So in one stage, we build the binary, the pocket-based binary or our app. Then we have a scratch image, which is basically just an empty image. And we just copy just the binary and some SSL or TLS certs. So we can, you know, do TLS and encrypt. Uh, between the front and back end. And then we just start our app like uh, with similar parameters to what we had before. Next, there's a few places you could deploy. I've just put fly.io, mostly because there was a GitHub discussion on the pocket base uh, uh, page itself about um, uh, with a tutorial about how to deploy to fly.io. And I, I really liked it. And they actually have a really good technical blog. I definitely recommend reading. They're doing some really cool stuff with SQLite. But anyways, so we, uh, we point it to our Docker file. So when we run the fly deploy command in just a second, it will build that Docker image and deploy that as a container. Then we also want to provide it some mounts. These are basically volumes if you're thinking in the Docker world. And that will basically save our SQL uh, like DB data and it won't uh, be erased between multiple redeploys. We can run it like so, fly deploy. Uh, and if we wanted to automate that a little bit, uh, we could use, for example, GitLab CI. And assuming we've authenticated with fly.io, which is not difficult, we can just deploy that. So every time we merge in with the main uh, branch or master branch, it will deploy our app. Uh, some other features, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, and then uh, some caveats. Uh, like everything else in uh, software engineering, Pocket base is not a silver bullet. So there's a few things to consider. You do need to self-host. I showed you how to do it in fly.io. 
Uh, but there's this other tool called Pocket Host. It doesn't have a stable API, and it can only scale vertically at the moment because of that, that SQLite database, though Fly.io are doing some cool stuff with uh, LightFS, which will sync data between multiple SQLite instances, I believe. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.